yourself shortly. Um, so for those of you that are just joining us for the first time, uh, we are Free Them All in San Diego, who is a coalition of migrants rights organizations and activists committed to the closure of Time at Detention Center at the San Diego Tijuana border. Um, and it's also part of a bigger um, abolitionist project that connects borders, prisons, detention centers as part of a bigger structure that um, continues to make death uh, amongst many communities, um, communities, especially from the global south. And so um, as part of the Freedom All Coalition, we have a political education committee who is, is putting on these events. So I would love everyone to just say a quick hi, um, starting with Evan. Hello, everybody. My name is Evan. I use he, him, his pronouns, and um, I'm part of the Freedom All Coalition. I'm an artist, filmmaker, and um, I'm happy people are partic participating in, in communicating and, and learning together. Um, Thanks, Evan. Uh, yeah. Jess. Hello everyone, my name is Jess Watcott. I'm an educator here in San Diego and I've been part of the Free Them All Political Education Committee for a few months. Super excited about our panelists tonight. Thanks Jess. Fatima. Hi all, I'm Fatima Altayeb. I'm also an educator, um, also part of Free Them All since earlier this year and also very excited about tonight. Thanks, Fatima. Chris. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chris, a member of the uh, Free the Mall Coalition here in San Diego. And um, yeah, very uh, excited for a wonderful discussion this evening. Awesome. Thank you. And then my co facilitator, America, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is America, and I'm a political educator. I'm um, zooming in from unceded territory, Kumeyaay territory, and I'm also part of the Freedom All Coalition. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for introducing themselves. So the reason why um, this committee exists is because we wanted to make sure that we would always be engaging with communities and individuals that are already doing a lot of the work of social justice um, on the ground and for us to be able to find each other and share our perspectives um, to create a better understanding of how we can um, see the full scope of, of this abolitionist movement, especially here in San Diego and Tijuana, um, and also cultivating our commitment um, that goes deeper um, with each other and finding each other and meeting each other. So the first uh, education, um, political education series that, that we started with was in September 30th with um, the theme of Another World is Possible, kind of seeing what is already being done, what is this other world that people are already creating, and that led into our second series um, about testimonies of migration, detention, and solidarity, where we emphasize the importance of solidarity and relationships. And so this time we're really zooming out to examine the worldwide history of colonialism and American imperialism and racial capitalism, and really trying to understand together here tonight how borders and restrictive migration have have done a lot to amplify this global economic relation through capitalism. And so just a quick note that we will be recording this session just when the panelists are speaking. Um, we will not be recording when we do our breakout sessions and we're talking more intimately with each other. So just in case you have any issues with, with um, being recorded, please turn off your, your camera. Um, you won't be recorded and we will post these at a later date online. And so right now I'm just gonna turn it over to America to introduce our first panelist, and then we'll go through um, our, our three panelists and then we'll all get to, to engage with the topics tonight. Thank you and welcome America. Thank you, Leslie. So the um, topic for um, this, uh, this week is colonialism, racial capitalism and borders. This panel and dialogue will focus on the worldwide history of colonialism, um, American imperialism and racial capitalism. This workshop will expand on the conversation and functions um, that borders and restrictive um, migration play in neoliberalism, as well as ground these current struggles within border. Uh, broader history. We have invited um, folks um, engaged in social justice and theoretical work to help us cultivate deeper commitments to the struggle. And we will hear from Alicia Schmidt-Gamacho, Devi Machete, 
uh, from Contra, Contra Viento y Marea in Tijuana and Danny Cotton from the uh, Refugee Action Coalition in uh, Sydney, Australia. And so our first speaker, I am honored um, to introduce Dr. Alicia Smith uh, Camacho. She's a professor of ethnicity, race and migration at Yale University and founder of the Migrant Justice Initiative, a multidisciplinary project for scholars to document and engage with migrant led organization uh, organizing and to shape better understanding of migrant realities in the Americas. So our first question for um, Dr. Alicia is, can you uh, talk about, um, talk on the political context of borders and how and why um, is an analysis of capitalism, neoliberalism necessary for deconstructing borders? Well, um, first of all, I want to just warn you that I seem to be, I'm getting messages that my um, internet is unstable. So if I freeze, I apologize. Um, thank you so much for this invitation to speak to you. And I um, want to say thank you to the fellow panelists and organizers here. And, and thank you all for the extraordinary work you've been doing. Um, your work is felt, the impact of Freedom All is felt in the solidarity we hold with you um, in our efforts to be um, freeing and preventing um, the deportation of migrants, preventing the incarceration of poor people in our New Haven region as well. So I wanna just um, acknowledge that um, the main, question, right, is, is how we think about, um, about borders as extensions of a colonial framework of domination in, in the world, um, that it, and how to think about the economic system of capitalism as having instilled um, a racial uh, and um, uh, hierarchy in the organization of work and the organization um, of uh, access to rights and privileges of membership and citizenship, the enjoyment of the goods and protections of nation states and uh, the world economic system. Um, that's a lot to cover in a few minutes. And I wanted just to say a couple things here that in um, first off, that I think all of you recognize um, that um, we are told continuously that we are living in a migration, an immigration crisis, right? And that we are living in uh, a context in which um, migrants are um, understood only as displaced people who are um, coming and bringing their need to host countries and that unauthorized migrants therefore um, need to be controlled and managed, that immigration is a uh, human activity that needs to be managed and controlled by nation states. That's inherently uh, a projection of a form of political power and authority that uh, repeats the authoritarian imaginations of colonial regimes, which mobilized large networks of people um, through systems of forced migration, through systems that conscripted um, uh, Africans and indigenous people against their will to work in the service of, of imperial powers um, during um, the early phases of the current racial uh, capitalist system. But to think about just the chunk of time um, from the mid 1990s to the present or the mid 1980s and what gave rise to the Zapatista movement, the movement that tells us another world is possible, a movement that um, drew on indigenous uh, ways of knowing and engaging in the defense of community and territory and the earth um, to articulate freedom, right, against a capitalist system that it named as racist, as colonialist. What is it that the Zapatistas were rebelling against? They were rebelling against a system that had displaced um, thousands of people from their 
ancestral lands that had displaced them from an economic system based in sustainable um, living that in which uh, pueblos were organized around shared systems of land tenancy and in which um, um, people could expect to control the means uh, um, of, the, of the goods that they produced, um, right? That, that that in the Americas, but also is repeated in, the, um, in other parts of the world, that global capitalism had um, privatized land holdings, had extracted um, the mineral wealth and uh, petroleum from um, these collectively held lands in many parts of the world over a period uh, of the formation of industrial capitalism from the 1800s um, into the present day. But by 1990s, um, a new economic system um, that we now have come to call the neoliberal system gave rise to um, the greatest levels of economic inequality in the world. And so, um, the privatization of state assets, the de deregulation of finance institutions, um, the organization of trade in the service of um, uh, banking institutions in the global north, um, the denationalization of um, basic industrial systems and labor systems produced some of the greatest income inequality in the world. So we're looking at a world system right now where um, effectively the largest, um, th that migration is at its highest levels that it has been in human history. And that migration is, is a forced migration. It's not recognized, but a great deal of it, um, probably uh, upwards of 50% of it is, is forced migration um, of people fleeing um, the combined experiences of warfare of um, natural, um, of climate change and climate um, induced disasters in um, their home territories, as well as the displacement because of basic problems of landlessness and a lack of economic opportunity. Um, at the same time, private enterprise um, has uh, driven policies that make national governments clients of corporate power, right? And that same partnership, the partnership of government and corporate power is to be seen in the systems of policing, the systems of um, uh, carceral um, governance and the construction of borders. So um, there are two ways I want us to think about borders um, for, for this moment. Um, and that is that borders are a system of labor control um, and that they have been historically throughout the world systems by which governments control mobility as a means to organize an international division of labor that is deeply racialized, gendered, um, and that um, borders are also mechanisms of domination, right? That systems, that human mobility um, is seen as threatening to the sovereign power of nation states is um, simply a reminder that um, human mobility threatens the exercise of um, power um, and in, um, in a world that has been increasingly integrated and increasingly dependent on um, um, the movement of goods and people around the world. So those are sort of the broad formations I wanted to say, but I wanted to just refer on a couple, a couple things that um, to me are important about thinking about migrants, is that migration has long historically been a resource against domination, that mobility has been the mechanism by which poor people have resisted um, authoritarian regimes, um, whether they are in the form of colonial regimes, in the form of dictatorships and military um, uh, regimes in Central America, in um, places throughout um, the world, people move 
as a means to resist politically and as a means to um, ensure their own survival. And in the context of the Americas, right, the peoples coming through Mexico, th through Central America, through Mexico and into the US from parts of Africa, from parts of Asia, um, from the Caribbean and from Central America and, and further south, right? These are people who are fleeing a combination of a long history of uh, predatory um, governments um, and governments that were clients of um, both uh, the IMF and uh, the International Monetary Fund and clients of global capital looking for foreign investment. And so essentially migration is a struggle from below, um, in my view, against um, these elite alliances. And as such, criminalization is a mechanism by which national governments deny responsibility for um, the very people they serve and govern. And one last thing I will, I will say, um, if this is just, you tell me if this is where you wanted us to go, right? Is that in the Americas, um, we often fight for the possibility to name um, Central Americans um, and other displaced um, people, particularly displaced indigenous people as refugees to recognize that they are fleeing forms of um, state power and forms of violence, um, social violence in their home communities um, from governments that have been um, militarized by and with the support of the United States um, that are supported by um, a US imperial regime, including military training and investment. But at the same time, we often fail to recognize how centrally important those same people who are displaced, who are fleeing forms of um, political domination and violence in their home communities are also the backbone of the region's economy. So um, part of the challenge here for us is to think about borders both in their political function and also their economic and social function as a mechanism for organizing this international division of labor. And there are two things that um, you know, I wanna leave you with, which is that we have lived in the last um, four years, an accelerated process of a project that has existed in the American imaginary, um, political imaginary over century. And that is the, the fantasy of creating a closed border of creating a system that could perfect uh, a border that could be sealed and could serve as a filtration system, as a system that allows US agents and their Mexican partners to determine who may enter, who has rights of mobility, who has rights of protection, and who can be excluded and cast out, right? That isn't a new vision you in, uh, San Diego and Tijuana know this better than anyone else. This has been a long time um, project um, shared by the Mexican government in many uh, instances. The Mexican government has participated in the forced repatriation of its own Mexican nationals from, from the US. Um, but you have lived, those of you joining from San Diego have lived through a period where that was accelerated and exaggerate it to extraordinary means, um, creating camps um, that were a visible um, uh, demonstration of the disposition of this government to engage in um, a higher level of ethnic cleansing than it has participated in in, um, in many, many decades, right? But it, it is, essentially a form of ethnic cleansing in the way that it has been targeted to black, indigenous uh, and uh, Central American migrants um, who are living in these conditions. Um, for our conversation, um, the next time I get to contribute, I would like to flip this, which is to ask, what is it about migrants that is so threatening and subversive that it creates 
this extraordinary mobilization of uh, military technology and force. What is it that um, the US and regional governments in Central America and Mexico are investing so heavily to deny, right? And so I want to say um, that migrants have become threatening in a period in which these regional governments are not providing for their own citizens. Even um, it's relatively privileged sedentary middle classes are, have suffered tremendously in this period, a decline in standard of living and access to basic um, government uh, resources in which these governments have ceased to operate um, by democratic means. And as such, I think migrants become threatening um, because they are deeply subversive of um, these regimes. Um, and so in our next conversation about what migrant justice looks like, um, the kind of migrant justice that is animating the struggle to free them all, I wanna just make the case that migrants are, um, migrant justice campaigns like the ones you're involved in are carrying the weight of resistance to authoritarian um, regimes in the Americas and around the world. And for that reason, have become extraordinarily threatening to um, regional governments um, in, in these last um, four years. Um, I'll leave it there. I hope that I've covered some of the themes that you wanna talk about. Happy to come back to any of them. Thanks. Thank you so much for that um, amazing introduction and, and just context for, for engaging the work that a lot of people have been doing. Um, and I just wanted to kind of add on before introducing the next speaker that it's been two years exactly, um, November 25th, 2018, that we saw that state violence um, for those of us that were, you know, at the at the March in Solidarity and um, at the park next to next to the border wall, where we saw the tear gas, we smelled the tear gas, and we we saw the, the bullets fly um, because the Central American caravan was a direct threat to the United States sovereignty. So thank you for bringing that up. And, and a lot of the work, whether it's in the media or not, is still happening since that moment. Um, and that's why I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker, Devi Machete, who is um, an artist and co-founder organizer of Contra Viento y Marea, which is a resource center at the front lines in Tijuana, um, a community ki a kitchen, a garden that's run by and for Central American uh, migrants and refugee youth in, in Tijuana. Um, and it's, it's definitely a product of, of that time two years ago. So very excited. Um, Devi, um, if you could share with us your, your offering, um, if you have 10, 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. And it was really insightful to hear um, Professor Alicia introduce the topic so well. Um, so I'm Devi Machete. I am uh, co-founder and organizer of Contra Viento y Marea. Um, we were founded by Central American youth that came with the November 2018 migrant caravan from Central America, which was the largest migrant caravan to date. And um, we are currently operated by all volunteers that came from that caravan, with the exception of myself. I'm a US-based organizer that moved here in solidarity and support. Um, yeah, and we're really unique because we're organized on a consensus-based model where we don't have a hierarchy of leaders. We don't have a board of directors or an executive director. We're all just volunteers and we share power collectively to make decisions autonomously that best serve our community. So I want to start off um, by saying that um, this talk is particularly about migrants and refugees of color in my capacity to speak on the Central American migrant experience. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that the United States was founded by three main groups and no, not the founding fathers. It was founded through the physical labor of enslaved African people stolen from an entire continent by European colonists forcibly brought here to work the stolen lands of indigenous peoples subjected to genocide by white settler colonialist agenda and subsequently built through the blood, sweat, and tears of migrants and refugees who have been over, overwhelmingly displaced from their homelands by US imperialism. I wanna acknowledge that it's because of movements throughout history from 
the Black Panther Party, to the Young Lords, to the Stonewall and riots, that we are standing on the front lines of liberation struggles today. We are standing on the shoulders of giants who have come before us and who are currently in the struggle with us and have opened up the space for us to continue fighting. So with that acknowledgement, I also wanna render visible <clears throat> the fact that um, I am standing on occupied lands of the Tonga people who are still fighting for autonomy and against occupation to this very day. Um, I also wanna thank everyone for joining us. This conversation is really timely and important. If we lived in a free democratic society, we would be hearing news reports all the time that cover how US foreign policies and by extension, how US multinational corporations are raping and pillaging Latin America for literal profiteering of a few wealthy families. We would be taught in schools the real history of our country that white settler colonialism is causing an immense damage not only to the world's poorest people, but to the gem of a planet where we inhabit. Um, but that's not the case. And so it's up to us, those who are organizing in our communities to secure human rights and civil rights to share the facts for us and other people who care about history and international relations and who, who are on the front lines to really speak power to truth. And I welcome this space to learn from all of you as well as to teach what I know about migrant and refugee organizing, living here and fighting in Tijuana. I will focus this discussion on migrants and refugees in particular, Central American migrant and refugee youth. Um, I wanna quickly just mention a couple things about the roots of the refugee crisis, how US foreign policy and extractive industries by multinational corporations in Central America multiplied by global warming's natural disasters are historically driving thousands of asylum seekers out of their homelands. I want to also center the term border industrial complex which refers to the heightened militarization of the US-Mexico border for the financial gain of state and non-state actors to the detriment of migrants and refugees. Um, my comments will explore the continuum of US imperialism, catastrophic climate change, and the brutality of the border industrial complex producing overlapping crises along the border from the perspective of migrant youth. So the youth I organize are primarily from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and they're incredible because they're ordinary people with extraordinary courage. We founded this uh, frontline resource center, community kitchen and garden because we believe that uh, the most forgotten people of our extremely impoverished neighborhood who are now most impacted by coronavirus um, need to have their human and civil rights upheld and who better than us ourselves to organize among our community um, using tactics of direct action, mutual aid, and transnational solidarity in order to bring about the change we want to see in the world. And it starts with us, and it starts here, and it starts now. So I also want to mention that besides helping migrants, we support everyone who comes to our doors. That includes the local homeless population, migrants who have just been deported from the US, um, that includes poor families from the neighborhood who have kids of all ages, as well as people who are physically and mentally disabled. Um, we have built this oasis where we offer dignity, care, and respect to every single person because we, we see them as our own community. We see them as if they were members of our own family and as our friends. We're organizing from a position of friendship and solidarity, not charity, which means <laughs> that essentially we are creating a microcosm of a better world where we wanna live. And in doing so, we believe that we can accomplish that with grassroots organizing tactics. In the face of this public healthcare crisis that's caused by COVID, the increased militarization of the US-Mexico border and the serious dangers we're facing coming from multiple organized crime syndicates that operate in Tijuana, migrant organizers are using stratagems that I mentioned mutual aid, direct action, and transnational solidarity. Um, what, those, what those stratagems mean, mutual aid, it means that we pull together the resources that we have within our networks and our community in order to uplift the most vulnerable. Direct action can be described as organized <laughs> random acts of kindness for, <laughs> as a definition that works for me. 
that means that you see a need and you act and you pull together the resources that you have with, with your networks to fill the void, to fill the need of people. If you see hungry people organizing food, if those hungry people need shoes, organizing ways to get donations of shoes and clothes and jackets down to where they need them and give them out for free. So just to say that all our services, uh, all our goods, uh, frontline goods are free. And we also offer other services. Um, we've partnered with other groups in the community. One example is we work with um, Refugee Health Alliance, which is a group of, of doctors that um, have a clinic called Justicia en Salud. We serve two meals outside of their clinic every week. And we also um, operate a telemental healthcare service. We have a tablet that connects to Zoom, Skype, uh, Google Meets, and they have provided the mental health care professionals so that people who are having a mental health crisis can come use this tablet to connect with direct services and also for reg regularly scheduled appointments that people can have to address uh, mental health care needs. So what we're up against right now is a tremendous amount of need given the holiday season, it's ever increasing. Um, there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of diseases of despair. So we're not just partnering with people here that are working locally with local groups. For example, we've also partnered with the Inland Empire Harm Reduction Coalition to um, have Narcan uh, in the no spray form available to give out for free. And so we see uh, a lot of folks in our community that are suffering from drug addiction and drug overdoses, especially related to fentanyl. And having Narcan available for free is saving lives. And I think that's that's the power of, of grassroots organizing, that it, it literally impacts people in a life or death way. I mean, for us, what we're doing here is human rights. I mean, it's about the right to food, the right to housing, the right to a decent income, the right to quality life-saving healthcare, basically to live with dignity and peace and respect. And it doesn't just mean the right to not be tortured or extortioned or disappeared or assassinated. Um, so I think the US definition of, of humanitarian aid is very limited. And I think we need to consider all of the things that make life visible and livable for us to, to consider as human aid when we're working in, in, this, in this area. Um, I want to also talk a little bit more about how a lot of the, the refugee crisis that we're seeing in, in particular from Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala, they're fleeing US foreign policies and detrimental free trade deals um, as, well, as well as IMF and World Bank mandated neoliberal austerity policies that are imposed on the people by their own governments who are essentially uh, U.S. backed dictators in some cases or right wing nationalists. Um, as Professor Noam Chomsky says, the U.S. doesn't hire terrorists, it hires terrorist states. They're much more effective, he says, end of quote. I would agree from, from his research, uh, looking at what he's written about in terms of uh, U.S. occupations of Central America, that there is a direct correlation between the military aid that the US gives and the deterioration of human rights in these countries. The more aid we give, the climate of human rights gets worse. We see more community organizers, feminists, indigenous and environmental leaders kidnapped, disappeared or outright assassinated. It is evident to scholars of history that US gives military aid to countries that will blatantly allow the US to rob them at will and take their natural resources. It is logical to conclude the US foreign policy through its funding and training of military leaders at the School of the Americas, now known as WINSEC, is driven by imperialist ambitions to steal by force the most precious natural resources of all of Latin America. So when we talk about the refugee crisis, we have to acknowledge that US foreign policy and free trade deals are at the center of this crisis. Um, what we're seeing is that people are crushed by poverty. Small farmers can't compete with heavily subsidized US agro businesses. And so they can't stay on their lands. 
we see people being pushed out by toxic extractive industries like mining and hydroelectric dams that also contaminate pristine wilderness. We're seeing how the US is behind mass displacement of refugees worldwide. And some of the most egregious examples are in Central America. And then the reaction of the US is not to let those refugees in or to help them despite their, their forced displacement. The reaction has been to pressure Mexico to detain the victims of US aggression and mercilessly deport them back to danger. So they're not able to even reach the border. I wanna move back a little bit to say that the work of the volunteers that we're doing is an example of intersectional resistance and movement building. We care about the intersectional forms of oppression that are killing us without being able to separate one or two forms of oppression from the rest of the equation of our suffering, exploitation, and overall man-made catastrophes at the border. Climate change, for example, is one of the most urgent crises of our lifetime. We care about climate change and global warming because environmental racism is displacing frontline indigenous, indigenous communities and an increase of natural disasters like we saw with Hurricane Eta and Hurricane Iota most recently, we're seeing a greater number of climate refugees. The UN estimates that by 2030, there will be an additional 20 million refugees worldwide displaced by climate chaos. We care about the issue of COVID because the pandemic hits POC communities the worst. Latinx, African-American and indigenous communities are more likely to die from, co from coronavirus than white communities. Then there's the issue of income inequality. The, uh, the abuse and exploitation of low wage workers that are suffering the most from COVID-19, especially immigrants working on fruit production lines and at slaughterhouses. Economic justice means reparations for the diaspora of Africans from all over the world, as well as a need to abide by treaties of sovereignty and reparations for indigenous communities currently under attack from multinational conglomerates and right-wing governments that back them in the cases of Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and even Brazil, and even in the Caribbean, like with Haiti. So I, I can go on a little bit more, but I don't know how much time I have left, and I want to be sure to give give space for other conversation, <laughs> okay. Um, I want to say that in closing, history teaches us one thing, and it is that power is never given freely. Power must be taken. To ensure our modern day movements for justice in solidarity with the historically marginalized do succeed, we must seize the day, carpe diem, and to some of us who love the night, seize the night, carpe noctum. But first, we must remember that we need to seize power, carpe potestas. Thank you. Thank you, Devi. That was powerful. Oh my gosh. Um, it's such a great, it's so inspiring to hear what it really looks like to do the work of resistance to all these structures of oppression in an intersectional way. Thank you for giving us those examples. Um, and we'll definitely have time after our breakout sessions to hear more from, from all of you. So, so keep those thoughts, um, Debbie. You. And for the rest of the folks, please feel free to ask questions in the chat so that we have a, a chance to engage the things that are coming up for you as well. Um, so I'll turn it over to America to introduce our next panelist. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Leslie. Um, in, in continuing to make these urgent transnational connections and in, in thinking about um, global disaster capitalism and how it's how it's showing up in different parts uh, of the world. I'd like to now turn it over to uh, Danny Cotton, who is an activist and member of the Refugee Action Coalition and Solidarity from Sydney, Australia. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm zooming in here from uh, North Sydney on unceded Gamaregal land, which is um, you know, very central, I think, when we're talking about the fights uh, against uh, racism and racial capitalism is that uh, these were some of the first people to, to resist um, uh, uh, the, the racist Australian state um, and that that, that struggle is ongoing. Um, we're, we're fighting to free uh, migrants and refugees from camps at the same time as um, Aboriginal people here in Australia are imprisoned at 25 times the rate of other people while being 3% of the population. They're 25% of our prison population here. So I think those are 
uh, to places where the, those struggles are, are very um, interwoven. Um, I'm just going to speak in, in two parts just a bit about the history of uh, the struggle here in Australia and people may not be kind of aware of kind of how bad it is here um, and has been historically re regarding, I guess, migration control um, and uh, talk a bit about the theory of, of why, why I think states do that. And then, uh, then I'll turn to maybe talking a bit about the strategic implications uh, for that as, as activists um, uh, seeking to fight it. So just to start off, like I, I think to add on to that, what people have already said about kind of uh, the way in which uh, capitalist states uh, are trying to create their own division of labor. Um, there are a couple of important things that I think uh, we, we can see from the Australian experience that uh, migration seeks to do. So the first thing I think is that this is a, a, a thoroughly ruling class project of, of producing um, their own geopolitical capitalist state competing against others. So here in Australia, the first act ever passed by uh, the Federated Australian um, Parliament was the, the White Australia Act, which explicitly racially discriminated to, to try to create a white nation. Why did they want to do this? Because they were trying to create in the middle of Asia on unceded Aboriginal country, um, their own racist fantasy of a white Australian nation. And so they, they were genuinely fear, fearful, the, the people who were creating this state, they were genuine, genuinely fearful of the other um, uh, states around them, in particular China and the fear of an invasion. And so I think while for them, um, the idea of people migrating to Australia is a, is the, is a threat um, them working here, I think to us as ordinary working class people, obviously I don't think that is a threat and actually there are huge solidarities to be found there and lessons to be learnt from working um, together. But I think the second thing that I wanted to talk about, I mean, in terms of this is, is a second function that has been really important in, in Australia and that's kind of a, a, an explicit nationalism and racism that I think is uh, co-produced alongside these camps. So. Here in Australia, uh, for the last two decades, uh, the, the Australian government has imprisoned any uh, refugees coming to Australia by boat in concentration camps, which, which Australia has set up in its former colonies and Pacific Islands. Um, and these camps are just utterly brutal. Uh, people have, have been killed and brutalised in these places. Um, and it has been a huge fight for us to uh, fight to, to welcome those refugees and bring them here. But I think what has been absolutely constant throughout the process of these camps is that they have attempted to use this to divide us by race and getting and 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 essentially as a scapegoat i think so in 2001 when they were first opened we had a very unpopular conservative government that was implementing uh, terrible anti anti worker legislation attacking people's rights to organize in their unions increasing taxes on the poorest of people um, and they used this period of, of um, increasing Islamophobia, particularly in the, in the light of the 9-11 um, attacks, um, to uh, make up explicit lies about refugees, it literally uh, fabricate evidence to try, and sh to try and pretend that they were throwing their children overboard. Um, and this is the exact same time that they literally uh, stopped a tanker of rescued refugees um, to, to set up these, these prison camps on, on, on islands and send them there uh, by paying off the corrupt officials there. Um, and, and that has just consistently been used as a, as a point to distract and say that instead of fighting against the government that's implementing these policies, uh, that we should actually be allying with them or see them as protecting us from these outside refugees and, and as if those refugees are in any way the problem or those migrants are in any way the problem. Um, and I think, I think both of these two, two things about kind of the, the necessity for um, states to try to uh, divide and rule to distract from their own uh, horrific agendas uh, it, and the need for them to compete against each other in their different states in militarized and geopolitical ways, I think are really inbuilt to, to capitalism. And so for that reason, I think we need to um, have quite a clear uh, uh, understanding of of how we how we can fight against um, not only the racism uh, but capitalism, and that's what leads me, I guess, to the second part I wanted to talk about in terms of what our organising efforts um, have been like. Because I think we've had a, a strategy uh, 
of essentially attempting to forge uh, a real unity between uh, working class people, um, in particular uh, unionized or like organized working class people um, and migrants and refugees themselves in their struggles against, um, against the racism that they experience. Um, and I think for us, this strategy has been really uh, essential to some of the biggest wins that we've had. So I just want to go over a bit of the history because we, we actually met, did build quite a huge movement in the early 2000s that was able to successfully close the camps. Um, uh, unfortunately, they were subsequently reopened by the same party that closed them, which is something I think people looking at a Biden victory will be thinking about, obviously. But yeah, we, to talk a bit about that, um, we built a, built, built basically in, in the, after they opened, opened these camps, there was, it was a, a time of real polarization. Um, and we were able to, right from the beginning, try to build, build those unities. So in the first, first rallies in 2000, um, we had, uh, we had union, union speakers from major unions speaking at every single rally around the country in, in, in those first rallies. And we continued to uh, attempt to raise motions in different union conferences. And we have kind of a social democratic party here affiliated to the unions, which I understand you don't have in the States, but kind of through that as well, trying to really influence those ideas of racism that are so, so toxic um, to, uh, and, and uh, have a long history in the working class movement here. So I think are very important to uh, resist, um, but essentially like a, quite a mass movement um, huge rallies uh, where we tried to build, build those big um, big coalitions into a mass movement, uh, was able to really shift public opinion, force concessions that's from the conservative government. They freed children, they um, relaxed uh, some of the worst aspects of offshore detention. Um, and eventually we managed to force the Labor Party then to take a position to the election of being against, against offshore processing and for freeing the refugees. It took another year for us to force them to actually do that, but it was a serious win that um, they were elected and, and we did, did close that. Um, but I think uh, beyond, beyond the kind of that big political process um, and, and how important I think it was for us to build really broad coalitions to fight together on a really mass scale, I just wanted to talk about one specific example in 2016, which I think is really powerful in terms of showing what that, what that resistance can look like. Um, and, and what it was is uh, we, we had uh, fought to uh, bring refugees here to Australia for medical treatment um, because the, on these islands, it is absolutely not acceptable. People have died from uh, the lack of healthcare, uh, just uh, very hot, cramped, degrading conditions, uh, racist Australian security guards that get flown over there um, who, who threaten them um, and they ally with local police forces to like literally attack uh, refugees. So it's, it's very bad conditions. Um, but yeah, after, after people had been moved here, there was an attempt by the government to deport, to deport those same refugees. So there was 267 refugees that they were trying to deport. Um, and, and, you know, on, in a history, we've seen that teachers and nurses were, were particularly strong on the, on the question of refugees and standing up against racism. And actually a group of um, nurses at, at a Brisbane hospital uh, said, no, we are not gonna deport it. We're not gonna, we're not gonna stand for this. We will not let, we will not release. It was a particular baby, Asha, that they, we will not release. We're not con convinced that she will be safe when she gets sent back to Nauru. And this became just a lightning rod for, um, us to fight fight back. So uh, once 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 we learned that that was happening, uh, rushes of unions uh, came around this Brisbane Brisbane hospital from all different sectors, uh, and we had the head of the entire union federation saying that they supported this. They stood against offshore processing, which was a really big breakthrough. Um, the head of the maritime union, which is a very strong union here in Australia, said, "If you move on Baby Asha, you move on fifteen thousand maritime union members." Um, we had the teachers standing up saying that we teach these refugees. Um, uh, and, and yeah, the, this is, this is all, all, all part of our, part of our fight as teachers to, to say no to the kind of racism that our students uh, experience. And actually, as a result of this kind of radical action that seeks to 
use the power of uh, working class people to stop production, to, to stop the government in its tracks from being able to what it wants to do, what it wants to do. Those refugees are all still in Australia to this day. Um, and to give an idea, like this is something where unions came in, we had Rohingya community people setting up lunches who are an oppressed minority in Myanmar, setting, setting up to feed these masses of people standing up for refugee rights. So I, to me, that's one of the most inspiring moments in, in kind of our history of struggle here that shows the kind of unities that we can um, have. Um, I'll, I'll try to just finish off, but I, I think, yeah, the, the agency of, of refugees to fight and the agency of us to fight, uh, I think is an ultimate political solidarity that is able to be, to be found. So as we speak, refugees are in their sixth day of locking themselves into their rooms. And so we'll, we'll, we'll be, um, uh, which is a, like, a, a, like a, a great form of protest for people who um, have been locked away and kept away from where people can see them. Um, and yeah, we've, we've been seeing our protests week on week in, in Melbourne and Brisbane here in Australia, and those are continuing. Uh, we've got another big national demonstration in early December. Um, but I, I'll, I guess I'll just close by saying that I think that I've, I've tried to say that, that, that these solidarities are really necessary between the working class and, and migrants for, for both of our struggles. I think that not only is it the fact that it's absolutely necessary. If, if the working class and ordinary people are gonna change anything about the government, we're never gonna succeed as long as there is any amount of racism, uh, division that we allow to, to um, seek to divide us. Um, but also I think that these kinds of alliances can bring about uh, really deep structural challenges that can un uproot, uh, not just challenging the racism, but also uprooting the structures that produce the, the racist camps that they want to that they want to create the people who run Australia, the US, and the governments all around the world. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that kind of radical fight can begin to not only challenge racism but also the capitalist system that needs the racism in order to justify it. But, but yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Danny, for sharing the really important strategies and. Uh, the importance of solidarity um, in these uh, transnational connections. I want to turn it over to uh, Doctora Alicia, if you can speak more about the work that you are currently doing, um, and also um, if you can also um, maybe add um, in terms of the connections that you see uh, in, among our panelists today. Um. Thank you so much. Just really um, grateful for the example of organizing and a reminder again that um, the long traditions of indigenous uh, resistance and of black uh, resistance um, to racial governance have really animated the most important social justice movements of our time. Um, and they have come together, as um, Debbie said, in an intersectional framework. Um, these are organizations and movements that have moved very quickly over the last um, 20 years, learned a great deal about the importance of centering a critique of uh, um, um, homophobia, a critique of uh, militarism in the defense of migrant rights, that they understand um, that the defense of autonomy of migrant communities across borders is connected to all these ex essential struggles um, to end gender violence, to address um, other forms of state violence against queer uh, and trans and LGBT people. So just briefly, um, I work with a network of scholars um, here um, that we call ourselves a migrant justice um, initiative, um, borrowing a framework that has emerged out of migrant led organizing in the Americas um, that is anchored, um, I think foremost in a Central American model of organizing, specifically the long history of Salvadoran diaspora organizing in uh, the US um, that has been critical to looking at the intersections between um, state violence and uh, extractive capitalist um, um, predation in Central America and the Isthmus. I'm on a webinar, but I think I'll get off of it. Why don't we eat? And so um, 
What I, Migrant Justice Initiative has a, a couple principles. First is that um, we're interested to know how it is that unauthorized and undocumented migrants understand the struggle that they're in and what model of organizing do they bring to anti-racist struggle, to the fight against police violence, um, to labor organizing, to environmental justice action. How is it that the, the defense of mobility, of human mobility, um, creates the opportunity for political action just in the way that Danny talked about, just in the way that Devi talked about, for building solidarity, for building alternate economic models. And again, it's a tradition that is um, shaped in the US by the history of Black um, and Indigenous organizing, um, because people who are kept formally rightless, right, who cannot depend on the state for protection or support, financial support of any kind, um, those who are excluded and who can be subject to arbitrary um, violence by the state or by, fellow, by citizens have to find forms of organizing by which to exercise their own survival. And this isn't a matter of being more virtuous or being more ethically minded. It's um, a very pragmatic, long history, right? So Debbie mentioned mutual aid societies, right? Mutual aid is essentially built on a system um, of shared cooperation um, and the requirement that people organize in solidarity and look out for each other in conditions of danger where they can, can't count on any state um, or private support, right? That, that they themselves are um, forced to stand up and defend, right? So you take example of um, farm workers. Um, uh, I have an example from Gerardo Reyes Chavez, who um, helped really transform the cultivation of tomatoes um, through the Amakali model, really remade parts of agribusiness, um, delivered the biggest challenge to the food system um, from the position of the most vulnerable class of workers in uh, North America farm workers um, and miners, I would say, and fisher, fishing people, people in the food industry um, have, um, he said, right, we're the ones who suffer, so we're the ones who organize, right? So we have a tendency, um, people um, with citizenship rights, people with um, access to state protections, to imagine the migrants that we saw in the caravan as simply people of need, people who are in desperate circumstances, they are that, but they are also some of the most extraordinarily resourceful people um, in, in the hemisphere. And the people who managed to organize in the caravan um, organized a system that challenged, that broke through barrier after barrier, right? It literally took tear gas and military force to restrain these people, right? Um, so it is a show of enormous solidarity to persuade young men to stay alongside elders, people with children, people who are sick along that long corridor through Mexico um, to give up their own um, interests in the service of um, the others. And that's um, what the caravan um, is based on is a system um, that defines a, a reckoning with shared fate, right? That um, the, the, caravan um, that we saw coming out of Central America has produced other caravans of protest. So there is the Transmigrante caravan that brought gay and trans migrants from Central America through Mexico, organizing every step of the way um, that they were making their way into the US and organizing once they were in migrant detention centers in Arizona, Texas, and California. Um, leading some of the extraordinary hunger strikes that have really remade um, the migrant justice movement in the Americas. So essentially our work is to understand how, what it is that a migrant led political movement looks like and what is the, un, what is the reason for the choques, the friction between that migrant led form of organizing and building power building 
and the organized um, politic, uh, sort of beltway dominated um, official immigrant rights movement, right? The ones that are tied up with NGOs or civil rights organizations that no longer organize, right? Um, the fractures in the US between organized labor and day worker centers or worker centers that serve the population that unions didn't want to organize, right? Women, um, people of color, uh, migrant workers, um, queer people, right? Um, criminalized people. So um, migrants have revived um, the major social justice movements in the Americas. And here I count black migrants as part of the major leadership of the movement for black lives. And there has been an extraordinary fusion in the last few years between um, the movement against uh, for abolition and the movement against state terror on people of color communities in the US and this much broader um, array of migrant led movements and indigenous rights movements in the hemisphere. So uh, I don't know more in Canada and the movement um, for reckoning with the history of settler colonial violence that, um, that you were talking about, movements in Central America um, and Mexico around indigenous land rights and for um, uh, reparations um, from uh, um, the, the Mexican government, movements against militarized violence in, um, in Honduras and uh, Guatemala and El Salvador in particular, these are intimately linked with the diaspora from Central America and Mexico of um, forcibly displaced people um, who um, have fled um, repression and who have been made um, effectively stateless because of the US sponsored, but also Mexican sponsored war on drugs, um, uh, a war uh, um, that ought to be understood as integral to this stage of capitalism, right? That the drug industry, the arms industry, the human trafficking industries that have so overtaken Mexico are deeply linked to the formal capitalist market and the extractive um, nature of um, a globally integrated so-called free trade system. So again, my, my point here is that migrant justice campaigns, that the defense of human mobility, the defense that we um, ought to have the right, right, to move, to create families, to create um, communities across borders, to seek our own survival, right? That that is, that statement is um, up against um, the forms of tyranny <laughs> of this age, right? A carceral system that gives to the state the right to say who has the right to move freely, who has the right to have rights, um, right? And um, migrant action then against criminalization and expulsion, along with the movement for Black Lives that has animated a global movement for Black Lives that is part of uh, uh, an anti-racist movement that has long been multinational um, and, and global, right? These are responsible for reviving a dormant citizenry that has been left really passive in the face of um, uh, the rightward turn in the democracies of North America or so-called democracies. So just very quickly, I'd say that um, what I define what we define in our group are three different kinds of mobilizations, right? There is an immigrant rights movement that seeks to incorporate migrants in the terms set by nation states, right? Through formal incorporation, through citizenship. And migrants have often rejected it, right? They are unruly. They are um, unwilling to come to uh, the, the aid of a democratic party that has no real use for them. Right, um, because they understand that actually citizens are not served by this government. And so they have been slow to naturalize. They are slow to um, serve, even though migrants did rescue the Democratic Party um, this time around. Um, there is also something that I would call migrant defense, which is sort of the dominant mode that we're in. We're not able to change the rules of incorporation into the go into government. We're working to defend migrant communities to protect ourselves against removal, against incarceration. Um, it's worth saying again, that's really powerful 
what that migrant defense has, we feel beleaguered, but it is worth remembering how much worse the, <laughs> the state of the world would be if migrants had not been pushing against raids against um, 287G. Um, and then finally, there is migrant justice, which takes on the very idea of the border itself and is building solidarity economies along the way, just in the way that Debbie and Danny are talking about and looking to erode the boundary between citizen and non-citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia, for bringing all those points together um, very brilliantly. And I think now it'll be a really good segue into learning um, from each other and all of the work that many folks I know in the Zoom are already involved with. So this is gonna be our time to link up and, and share um, the resources that we already have and also to ask questions to each other. So we have prepared uh, breakout sessions for everyone to talk and meet new folks uh, for the next 20 minutes. I am posting in the group chat um, a quick facilitation strategy for folks just to uh, be cognizant, introduce yourselves, um, pronouns. If you're with an org, please introduce your org. Um, and then we would like to um, invite you to answer the following questions in your, in your group and expand on, on what's already been said. So some of the questions we would love for you all to discuss is, how we infuse a, a critique of capitalism and colonialism into our already existing work. Um, in addition, how does anti-racist work look like at the border or any of the borders that, that we're proximate to? Um, what are the organizations that are already doing this work beyond the ones we've heard from? And how are you all um, you know, creating this other world once we abolish these systems? So please feel free to go through those and or others um, that come up and we will see you at 7.35 once we come back and debrief. So make sure someone will be able to share out your conversations. So someone take notes. So um, we'll have the breakout groups open up and have fun meeting new folks. Okay, hopefully I'll come back. As Leslie mentioned, um, hopefully you all had um, uh, really important connections, getting to know each other, seeing the work and some of the um, uh, you know, insight that you all shared together. So I'm gonna be facilitating the um, this larger breakout session where we kind of report back. So we can get started with anybody who's, um, in their group who'd like to get started, anybody in particular. And again, um, just share out uh, a quick report back about some of the main points that you all talked about. So I think I see uh, Ireri. Hi, yes, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, sometimes I have tech difficulties. Um, so in our breakout group, it was amazing. <laughs> and I, I love um, making uh, new connections and, and meeting people and, and getting to talk in, in the breakout groups, which don't always go so well, but this one did. And one of the, um, one of the points that we touched on is providing support uh, for people who are detained and um, the ways that different groups go about doing it. Um, because of its um, the sensitivity of the work, it's it's more of, of an underground work, and it's something that may put off some of the volunteers um, or, or the people that come at this because they want to feel good, and um, and it's people like that, right? But you cannot put it on Instagram. You can say like, "This is what we did," and and being cognizant of um, people's autonomy and privacy that even though they're organizing while detained that their autonomy is respected and you know if if they want to give an interview great but if they don't then it's completely up to them and that they're not being pressured um, another thing we we talked touched on is how can we as organizers have each other's back and support each other doing this work and also providing support for people that are before they cross that are south of the border and then once they're detained and as much as we hate those terms, unfortunately, that is their story and then post release. Um, so that's, that's, we talked about so much, but those are my notes. That's what I wanted to share. Thank you, Ireri. Um, 
And let's see here. I think those are really great points to think about as well as, as we continue to organize uh, in these collective spaces and across transnationally, right? Um, having each other's backs and, and what does that look like and what does that mean, right? Um, and I'd love to hear from the other groups. Um, so I know that some folks were um, uh, kind of coming back with their main point. So I'd like to ask our second group and also if you could share the questions that you all were uh, talking about. Yeah, um, so, um, hi, my name is Austin. Um, so in our group, um, we talked about what organizations were already doing this work um, and how we can grow those spaces and movements. Um, so one of the organizations um, that we talked about uh, was um, the Sunrise Movement um, is doing some stuff around this, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, Dream Defenders is another really good group um, that's working on this. Um, they are like a youth-led organization of um, young organizers of color um, that are working around this. Um, so we just kind of talked about that. Um, we talked about what I think Anne-Marie is in here um, from Free Them All in San Francisco. Um, what we're doing, um, trying to stop the deportation of Cameroonian asylum seekers. Um, we talked about tactics with that, um, congressional outreach, as well as um, potentially trying to communicate with uh, the union pilots to try to stop the flight, um, if we could do something around that. Um, and just kind of talked with each other. It was really nice. Um, made some cool connections and some friends. Um, uh, but yeah, that, those were the, um, I think I'm probably leaving out at least an organization or two, um, if anybody else that was in the group could remember, um, anything that we said. The ACLU is also working on, um, some of these things, um, yeah, um, yeah, that was mostly it. Thank you, Austin. I think those are really great points as well. I appreciate um, uh, definitely thinking about uh, the different strategies, um, you know, the different strategies of resistance and by any means and also collaborating across, right? Um, so awesome, thank you. And let's see, let's go with our group number three. Whoever's out there and who um, can share next. I can just briefly share. Um, I think we neglected to have a note taker, um, but we talked about a wide variety of things, but I think that one of the things that's standing out to me is that we don't always know our own history with um, the border, that the borders that we live in are next to or near to the borderlands. Um, so, you know, like we, folks didn't know like all the changes that had happened um, since after 9-11 and how migration has been criminalized in the United States. And folks didn't know that, you know, the first migrant detention center was only built in, I think it was either 1985 or 1986. And so we've had a long history of free migration from place to place. And this idea that we need to control migration is a super new concept. And so, um, yeah, in my opinion, I don't think we should be afraid of open borders because that's how people have lived for thousands of years. Um, yeah, those are some of the things that we talked about. Definitely, thank you, Jess. And context matters, uh, thinking about, um, uh, naming and identifying these systems is really important in order to fight back against them, right? So I think that this is a really important point. Um, so thank you. Let's turn it over to our next group. Yeah, I can uh, talk a little bit about um, what our group talked about. Um, one of the things that, you know, um, I think that we, you know, observed is that like, just this basic fact about like, 
um, the capitalist system that we live under, like the vast majority of people in our society um, are like just ordinary working people. And the things that we have to do every day to survive, like go to our jobs or whatever, you know, it, you know, inadvertently end up kind of pushing this system forward, but it's not because, you know, it's not because the majority of people in the society love capitalism or think that this system is great. Like you can talk to anybody out there and like usually people have a complaint about, you know, an annoying boss or like the work just not being like all that interesting or satisfying or fulfilling of their like, um, of their needs on a, on a more broad level other than, you know, giving them a little bit of money, usually not enough to get by. Um, but that's all tied into these systems of like migration and, and, and movement. Um, and somebody has pointed out in the chat earlier that like obviously the rules around the movement of people are way, way different than the rules around, uh, around the movement of capital. Capital doesn't really have to deal with borders in the same way you know, international finance and international um, free trade agreements, uh, you know, supposedly free trade agreements, you know, it, it set up the rules of the game such that like, obviously the balance of power is tilted so heavily in the direction of the very small few of people at the top. Um, but what that means though, is that like, there is a lot of discontent out there amongst millions and actually billions of people around the world who don't think that this system um, is, is meeting everyone's needs. And so like the challenge for, for us as activists is to try and like reach more of, you know, the regular people out there who go to work in the world every day um, to recognize that like the scapegoating of migrants, the, the trying to, um, you know, whip up nationalist fervor against, you know, so-called so -called outsiders or whatever is really a deflection away from like the, the common interests that the vast majority of people share with one another as ordinary working people against the interest of their bosses and their, you know, uh, functionaries in, in the government who, who serve at their, um, you know, at their pleasure. But um, there is a lot of hope and, and some of the stories that have been shared in this discussion and in the previous discussions show the way of like, you know, building solidarity is actually like a huge act of resistance because that is the only way that we are going to really confront this system because they have all the wealth, they have the power, they have the force of the state and the military and the police and everything. But, you know, we have the sheer numbers uh, you know, just in terms of like our capacity um, to to work and to to continue to to make this system run, and when people do decide, like those nurses and teachers in Australia, um, like teachers here in 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 Los Angeles and Chicago, when people do decide that like they aren't going to continue to to accept the unfair conditions and are not going to be complicit in in the the brutal treatment of of these people. Um, who did nothing wrong, you know, they have the capacity to really shut things down and, and actually confront the system head on. And I think that that's, you know, a great example um, that we need more of going forward. So uh, yeah, thank you all. Um, really great discussion this evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris and your group. I think you highlight to the importance of thinking about intersection, intersectionality, right? Drawing from black feminists. Uh, particularly Kimberly Crenshaw and thinking about the intersections of our movements and inter intersectionality in, in terms of like uh, building and tapping into collective power. Um, so thank you for uh, y'all's insight. And so um, I think that uh, due to time, we're going to close out our discussion, but I really um, uh, enjoyed um, the, the more intimate conversations and thank you all for participating in, in these uh, discussions. So I'll turn it over to um, Leslie? Yeah, definitely. Um, we apologize for the timing, but if everyone, if anyone here has links to events that y'all are holding, your own organizations, your own contacts, please feel free to drop it in the chat so that we can compile it and send it out to, to all who participated in the, in the PolyEd workshop today. So don't be shy, drop, drop all your events and links and, and orgs and contacts in the chat. Um, so right now, transition back to 
back to the work and what that means. So one of the, the spaces that we wanted to open up is to give Devi um, the last word so that we can hear how we can plug into the work happening in Tijuana with Contra Viento y Marea um, and actually just hold a little bit of space for folks to be able to sign up. Um, so if you want to get involved with that or, or think about ways that your organization can help. Um, this is a perfect opportunity. So I'm going to turn it over to Devi, if you could um, give us your, your, your announcement. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful um, conversation and for sharing all of your great work um, across different um, areas. It's really imperative that we learn how to collaborate and um, build on a, each other's experiences and each other's work so that we are a much more solid and unbreakable movement, especially with the rise of um, white nationalism and, and fascism that we're seeing all across the globe. We're seeing the threat, um, not just coming from Trumpism, but we're seeing it in Latin America and across a lot of different countries um, in the Middle East, um, in Asia and Africa. And so it's imperative for us to be more united than ever as radicals, as people who are humanists and who care for the most vulnerable in our communities, in particular migrants, refugees, asylum seekers. And so with all that being said, I want to invite all of you to um, support our work down here at Contra Viento y Marea. As I had mentioned earlier, we are a frontline resource center, community kitchen, and a garden. And so the work that we're doing right now is um, providing home style meals for um, 100 to 150 people per serving. We're only serving four days a week now, but we're serving um, about, yeah, 100 to 150 per meal. And we're serving nutritious, mostly um, vegetarian homestyle comfort food. So it's a little bit um, difficult for us to um, continue uh, always looking for new sources of funding, given that we are an autonomous group. Um, we have a fiscal sponsor in the US, but we are um, primarily funded by small donations. And so right now for the holiday season, we're preparing to give out special meals um, for Friendsgiving tomorrow, um, we're planning to do a chicken noodle soup for folks. Um, and we are also planning to do something special for Christmas, a, a special meal. And also um, we have a lot more people that come to us with their needs right now. Um, so in addition to giving out food, um, we have um, support services like our telemental healthcare service that we provide, but we also allow people, for example, um, who have wounds. We have a lot of people who come asking for help with just like all kinds of wounds that they have. Um, and we provide gauze, alcohol support um, with wound dressing, but also other things that include support with drug overdoses. Um, and just in general, a lot of problems related to economic misery and exploitation <laughs> that make all our lives difficult. Um, and so other services that we, we provide here are clothing. Um, right now it's starting to get cold. So we're getting people coming. Um, we usually give out clothes once a week, but during these, um, these months, we try to give out um, twice a week and we're giving out um, jackets, shoes, blankets, towels, hygiene kits with soap and um, all other kinds of things that people need to, to take care of their, their own their personal bodies. Um, so right now, because of the pandemic, we're seeing an exponential amount of need on top of the fact that it's flu season. We also give out non-prescription meds. Um, so like Tylenol and um, those kinds of things. Um, we give out um, a whole range of, of stuff like that. So if folks are interested in donating, um, we really need the support. Um, we give out things like pregnancy tests as well. There's a whole host of things that folks living in poverty need. And we're one of the only places that gives it out for free. And literally whenever anyone knocks at our door, we, we answer and it doesn't matter day or night, we provide those services that are essential. Um, so yeah, if you have stuff to donate, um, we have several volunteers that live 
in Los Angeles and San Diego, we have a volunteer in Hawthorne where you can drop stuff off. Um, we would also ask for you to consider um, supporting us financially because we can't pay the light bill and the water bill with shoes or donations of, of rice. Um, but it's all essential and we really appreciate meeting everybody here and I definitely hope that this is the beginning of, of a relationship that we can have. I invite all of you to get to know me, to get to know the work we're doing here. And um, yeah, I look forward to con continue to collaborate with you all. Um, I think it's very important that we continue to find ways to, to, to show solidarity for each other, um, both sides of the border. And so if there's stuff that y'all need from us in any way, um, if y'all need data or support, um, I'm here for that too. I think it's mutual aid is not a one way street. So <laughs> let me know how I can, can support you and your needs as well. Oh, and the links I provided in the in the chat so that you can see our Facebook page where we post pictures of stuff we give out. Um, so you can look at our website. Um, as well as um, we have a YouTube channel by the same name. And um, yeah, let me know if there's any other things I can I can do to support. But thank you for being here. And um, I do want to say one last thing that I was reading. I read up. I try to read a lot, but I found this quote from uh, this pacifist that's supposedly very well known in the U.S. Um, in history as a as one of the main pacifists. His name is A.J. Muse, and he once said, "We must be a revolutionary before one can be a pacifist." And I think that's super insightful for me um, as somebody who loves humanity and loves animals um, and loves this earth, but also to think about how. Um, we need to be revolutionary to change this this current system, um, a society that's based on evil and violence and death and terror, exploitation, madness and abuse to destroy all that and render a new society built on love, life, compassion, joy, generosity, logic and egalitarian material and spiritual harmony. So thank you. Thank you, Debbie, so much. I'm going to, I, I just posted a Google uh, doc right now for anyone to be able to sign up. Um, please put your name, your email um, location um, so that we, so that Debbie can send you a direct email um, for ways to, to support all of the efforts that were just mentioned. Thank you all so much. So that concludes our third political workshop for Freedom All San Diego. Please look at the links again um, that were in the chat for Contra Viento y Marea. Um, but as well, we have a couple of announcements. Um, we will be taking a break in December in terms of our political ed um, series. So we'll see you back in January. And we will be having an open meeting for Freedom All San Diego if anybody just wants to get involved directly with the coalition decided a date yet, but it'll be either December 4th, um, December 14th or the 7th. Um, sorry, it'll be December 14th at 7 p.m. And any, anything else from the other groups that I'm leaving out? Awesome. Thank you so much to our panelists, Alicia Smith Camacho, um, to Devi, to Danny for the transnational conversations, and we will see each other again. Um, we will keep working together, and this is not the last that we will see each other. So thank you all so much. Have a beautiful evening or afternoon in Australia. <laughs>